Welcome. What is Titan? A no-code platform for Salesforce. What can you do with Titan? You can build forms, portals, document generation, e-signatures, maps, automation, and a lot more. Security is really important to us. Therefore, we are HIPAA compliant, PCI SSC compliant, GDPR 508, and ISO compliant. So what are you waiting for? Schedule a demo with us at Form Titan and let us build the impossible for Salesforce. We were just a bunch of nerdy kids who ignored the haters. We took their ridicule and we built on it. And when some of us gave up, well, we built on that too. Built resilience, built on a mission to make things a little better every day until the users came. Then the haters were VCs who scoffed at our audacity. This just isn't the way things are done. But we kept building. Users turned into teams, turned into companies, running their entire businesses on our apps. Then the software giants came after us. We weren't proven, we weren't fully featured, our radical cloud model wasn't secure, but we built on. And today, as companies adopt the cloud to move faster, teams are finding themselves slowed down by each other's efforts. The skeptics are claiming we'll never develop innovation at scale. But now, DevOps have come to the cloud, ushering in a new era of transformation. Companies can release on demand across hundreds of environments innovating faster with fewer conflicts and fewer disruptions. There will always be challenges. There will always be naysayers. And we'll build on. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about building a SaaS product on Heroku. Uh, Pretty cool title here. Um, in reality, what this is going to is uh, session is going to be about our path through doing this uh, in the real world, um, building a product in the Salesforce ecosystem on Heroku. So I'm really excited to to bring this to you. Uh, just to give you a little more insight in, about who I am, I've been in the Salesforce ecosystem for about seven years now. I've done a lot of things inside of Salesforce um, from Mar uh, Marketing Cloud, Pardot, Sales Cloud, Service Cloud, Heroku, Einstein Analytics. Um, so kind of done a lot of the, um, the different products inside of the Salesforce ecosystem. And currently I lead an AI and Salesforce practice at Horizontal Digital, uh, which is a consulting uh, partner based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So without any uh, more preamble here, why are we actually here? Um, so I'm going to be talking about this SaaS product we built. It's called a no-code preference center. Over the last year, we had a company um, that we were working with uh, horizontal and, and I joined horizontal about two years ago. And as I was joining, uh, we started coming up with some of these uh, more innovative ideas here. So let's, uh, let's dive a little further into this. So today we're gonna be talking about the SaaS product. We're gonna be talking about what is Heroku. We're gonna be talking about building that SaaS product and our use case going through that. So before we dive too far into the technology side of this, which is I'm sure what everyone wants to hear about, First, I, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about what does it take to go from ideation to product lifecycle and kind of build of this um, product in Heroku. Um, so I wanted to kind of lay out a couple of these blocks here that I thought were important. And a, a lot of you guys may have already been in the Heroku ecosystem. You may have already thought of some of these SaaS products, but when I was younger, I always thought, man, if I come up with a really good idea, and I get some money to back it up, I'm gonna be able to just go forward and sell it and it's gonna be amazing. You may, you guys may have uh, be familiar with the, uh, the show Shark Tank and you guys may be familiar with the concept of like kind of, you know, ideating and going to market. It's a lot more complicated than that. Um, even outside of the, the technology, just from going to ideation, um, you need to do market research, market validation. Uh, we, when we were building this product, we went into this business model canvas um, uh, kind of iteration of how do we fit this idea we have into the current ecosystem that's available right now. Um, so we, we went through that pro um, process of kind of making that fit, we went through this MVP of, you know, what is, what could the infrastructure look like? What does the data look like? What are some of the initial features we need? And once we built this MVP, we started launching it to a couple of our, um, our clients to see if there was a fit. And this is where we really come in with this market fit section here, trying to make adjustments to the product and kind of the, the business model to make sure that our clients and customers actually wanted to have this product. Um, from there, we went into the full build, the, the production, 
uh, go to market, uh, which is indicated right here, and then eventually moved in this, this ongoing life cycle. Um, so our product right now has been around for uh, about six months. Uh, we started uh, at the beginning of this year and we've, uh, we've gone through this full process now. And so I feel like we've, we've gone through enough of this pain that I can, I can come to you guys and share this. Um, so I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts about um, uh, beyond this, what does it take to actually launch a product? Um, it, it may seem pretty straightforward to just let's build the technology and let's dump it in there. It should be good. Um, so I'm going to pose a couple of questions just to get your guys' juice, uh, juices flowing. And then we'll actually dive into um, the technology and the components here. Um, so when you're thinking about your product, where do you store the data? How much data do you keep? Uh, how do you know if your app is actually performing well or not? What happens when there's a bug in a production instance? How do you actually upgrade a client who is, uh, you know, on a, on a live instance right now? Um, these are some of the questions that we came through as we were building the SaaS product and Heroku helped us quite a bit as we were building this product. So let's get into some of the fun um, components of a SaaS product now. Um, when you think about your product, if you're like me, you think about the end user experience. You think about what is the user gonna see? What features are they gonna have? How is it gonna help them solve the, their business problems? Um, when in reality, there's a lot more behind it. So I built this image here to kind of show you the different layers that um, come together when you're building a SaaS product. So of course you need to think of all the front end components here uh, indicated by this first layer. You need to think about those features and the UI and the UX of it. Um, but then when you're done with that, you need to think about how is this gonna be built on the back end? Where am I storing my information? How is it connecting to this, the um, internal user's um, workflow? And how do I get the data from the front end here to the back end? You're gonna need integrations between the two layers here. You're gonna need some type of connectivity between all these different pieces. Um, and then when you start getting a little bit further, you're gonna think about, okay, well now I have this MVP. How do I know if it's actually performing well? How do I know who's using what feature? And how do I know what their end customers are actually using as well? Um, and you're gonna need integration from there as well. And you need to pull the, all the information together. And eventually you're gonna need somewhere to store this. Uh, so you're gonna have a database of some sort or, or multiple depending on what you're trying to do. And throughout all of this, there's going to be this giant overhead of administration, air handling, logging the information and kind of this pipeline of building these features and products. Um, so on the surface of it, the product seems pretty cool and, and straightforward, you know, regardless of where it's hosted, but there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. And when you're building a SaaS product, there's a lot of infrastructure that goes on. And so the reason, one of the reasons why we chose Heroku was because Heroku helps us take a lot of those uh, integrate, uh, all, a lot of those infrastructure out of it and makes it uh, seamless for us. So what is Heroku? Well, Heroku is a cloud-based company that enables um, products to go to market faster and quicker, taking the infrastructure out of the equation here. So when I was in my early days of uh, technology, I worked in several uh, companies that I maintained their databases and their infrastructure. And that process is very painful. You have to worry about this, the smallest thing from a database failure, like an actual hard disk, all the way up to the point of software and an integration and everything other component about it. Uh, the event, one of the advantages of Heroku is it does all that for you. You really need to worry about your app, your features, and how it's getting to the end customer. So a couple of the, the main points here in Heroku are dynos. Dynos are essentially what your app is built on. That's what makes it function, and it allows you to scale your app to the size and scale you really need to. You have your database, and there are several options inside of Heroku. Um, we, in our app, use Postgres, and we'll get a little bit uh, further into that, but there is 24-7, 365 support on this database, and there's uh, multiple redundancies across it at an enterprise scale. And depending on what you're looking to do, there's even uh, you know, HIPAA compliance across uh, some of these uh, databases as well. And then there's the amazing add-on um, ecosystem that Heroku has. We use this very heavily in our app um, to allow us to... Um, you know, have a quicker and easier time of anywhere but thing, anything between um, logging to monitoring our analytics. Uh, we use it for some of our integrations. We use it for our uh, database, um, for Pro Postgres, and several other things as well. And so this ecosystem allows us to scale our app much faster than having to build everything from the ground up each time. 
Okay, so now we know a little bit about what Heroku is. We know a little bit about you know the, the reasons why we chose it. Um, one of the other reasons that I wanted to just mention here is scalability. So when you're building a SaaS product, um, you may have a, a client or two who are kind of your MVP cases um, as you're rolling this out. Um, but when you're thinking about this, you really need to think long-term. You need to think about how do I go from 10 customers to start with to 10,000 customers potentially in the future. And so instead of Heroku, they use um, this concept of vertical and horizontal scaling using dynos to be able to handle the volume and the complexity of your, um, your request inside of the Heroku ecosystem. Um, so inside of our app, we use this capability as well to enable our customers to scale from you know, 100 to 1,000 requests um, a minute to, um, to more if they're a larger enterprise and they're working through multiple different lines of business as well. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about Heroku and, and why it's so cool and all the, the features and functionality here. Um, let's get into our use case and dive a little bit further into um, how we're actually utilizing Heroku in our SaaS product. So as I mentioned before, our uh, product is called the No Code Preference Center, and uh, what it allows us, to, uh, our, us and our customers, to do is build a preference center with clicks and not code. So we work very heavily in the marketing cloud and the sales cloud space. And when you're working with marketing cloud, you need to send email communication to those customers, and you need the ability for them to manage what type of communication they receive. And so in marketing cloud right now, the native preference center is pretty bland and it's very difficult to work with. And so we've built this app inside of the Salesforce ecosystem to allow the companies that we're selling to, customers, to actually come to their preference centers, see their brand, and also enable them to uh, make changes as they want to. And so our product is built on Heroku and as a managed package in the sales cloud environment. So I'm gonna do a quick little demo of this and See if I can get this to continue. Okay. So as I mentioned, we are an approved app in the, um, uh, the app exchange here, and we were able to download the app from here. Uh, but I wanted to give you guys a hands-on experience of what this app looks like so that when I'm talking about the app in, in uh, a couple of minutes here, you kind of understand the context behind it. Okay. And I see that there's a couple of questions coming in and I will uh, answer those um, when we get a little bit further into the uh, presentation here. So jumping over into Sales Cloud, this is one of our demo instances here. Um, you can see that we do have a managed package, it's called the Notebook Preference Center. It has a collection of, of uh, objects and views and lightning components inside of it. So this is all pretty typical for a, like a Salesforce uh, app. Um, where our app is unique is there's actually an internal experience, which is what you're seeing here. This is what the companies would use to actually enable them to make changes to their preference center. <clears throat> but there's also a customer uh, experience as well. So there's the internal user and there's the external user. So jumping over to the preference center, this is actually the external experience. And this is what is built on uh, the Roku environment. You can see it from the URL up here. Uh, since this is a demo app, we kind of just left the URL as is. Uh, but this preference center allows them to make real-time modifications to their profile, their information, their interests, what they want to receive from the company, and their subscriptions of what type of communication and, and, um, and channels they'll actually receive this on. And the, as we were building this app, we realized that this communication needs to happen in real time. So if I make a change to one of my subscriptions, the company needs to know uh, in, in a matter of seconds or, or um, less, if possible, because this information is being changed externally by their customers, but it's also potentially being changed internally by the company too, um, as, as um, they work through their programs. So I wanted to give a little bit of context into what that looks like. Um, let's also dive a little bit into Heroku now too. So as we are going through um, the assessment of where do we build this product and how do we roll this out at an enterprise scale, uh, we were working closely with Salesforce to help us identify the right approach here. So instead of our enterprise Heroku instance, we actually have an, an enterprise Heroku account, um, which allows us to um, build and, and scale and have custom pricing around this. 
Um, so I'm going to pop open our, our development pipeline here and I'll touch a little bit on some of these features and um, tips here at the end because we've learned quite a bit going throughout this process here. Um, but you'll see that inside of Roku, you're able to manage multiple environments through a pipeline. So we actually um, have everything uh, developed inside of GitHub and we use the um, the workflow process through GitHub to move it from development to staging to production. And we use um, the, the concept of pull requests inside of GitHub to automatically deploy uh, feature uh, branches here, or what they in Heroku call review apps, which is very handy. So as we're going through the development cycle, instead of having to uh, have only one person make a change and then build that change to our development instance, and then another person make a change and potentially have conflicts, we're actually able to make branches and automatically deploy those and use these kind of scratch uh, review apps to test these features, go through the full, full QA process, and then um, you know, merge them back into the development branch and go through our, our formal uh, QA and into staging. So it's very handy that way. Um, if we go into one of our apps here into let's say dev, um, you'll start to see some of the Heroku features if you've never been to Heroku before. So this is an instance of an app here um, it has a public facing URL and it will have a lot of information connected to it. Um, so you can see in our development instance here, we are building everything through Heroku and it's automatically deploying as we're making changes. Uh, we also have a couple of crucial add-ons here, um, uh, which I'll talk more about here in a moment, but we use Heroku Postgres and Heroku Connect uh, to facilitate the data between Sales Cloud and um, Heroku. And then we also use a couple other add-ons I'll touch on here momentarily as well. Um, so let me jump back to my presentation now. Okay, so uh, let's go a little bit into our infrastructure here. So um, what does our app actually consist of? Um, well, it's not overly complicated, but it does have a couple of moving parts here. So on the left-hand side over here, you can see that we have our customer. So that is the person, ex the external customer who is actually interacting with a preference center, so not necessarily the buyer of our product. Um, those customers will actually view a preference center, the one I just showed you, that user interface. Um, that preference center is hosted in Heroku, so you can see that there's this gray box outlining all the Heroku components here. Um, it will have our app there. It'll be running on Dynos to allow it to um, scale and to manage the, um, uh, the actual app itself. Uh, we have Google Analytics running on it from a um, analytics perspective to give us an idea of who's using what features and who's uh, opting in and out at, at different levels. Uh, we use Heroku Postgres here uh, to capture all the information. And we use Heroku Connect to actually sync the information back to the client's sales cloud instance. So this is a really important key here. This Heroku Connect um, it is really gold uh, in, in my perspective. It, it really allows us to facilitate that real-time integration. And I'm actually gonna go into that next of uh, how we got to that decision and some of the pros and cons there. Um, some of the other um, uh, backing services that we have, um, it, we use logging through Paper Trail, which is a Heroku add-on. Uh, we use Sentry for air handling inside of our app. Um, and we use some, some other standalone apps that we've built inside of our Heroku instance to kind of manage some of the, uh, the record tracking and threshold management for some of our pricing tiers. Um, so everything is inside of this um, uh, Heroku environment here in this gray box. And then we have the client sales cloud instance, and that is where our managed package sits and how the information is facilitated back and forth between these two instances. And then in our case, we also have Marketing Cloud that we use several connectors in to pass the information as part of the product that we have rolled out here. Okay, so um, as you're thinking about Heroku from a SaaS product perspective, integration is gonna be a big thing that's on your mind. So one of the things you're gonna be thinking about is, should I use one of the Salesforce products or how should I integrate uh, my different um, systems? And so if you're thinking about the, the question of Salesforce Service Cloud to uh, Heroku, uh, there's about five options for you and, and maybe a couple more if you wanted to add on some third party solutions here. Um, Heroku Connect is one of them. Uh, it has its, its uh, pros and cons. Um, from a pro side, it is uh, fully bi-directional, which, um, which is phenomenal, especially when you're trying to do things like we are where we're making changes on both sides. Um, from a con perspective, it's a paid product. 
Um, so if you want to use it in a production instance, it's going to cost uh, based on the records that you're syncing over. So there's a couple of caveats there too, such as the fact that Heroku Connect only allows you to connect to the full object. You can't filter down to a subset of the records. So as you're thinking about this integration and, and integrating into your client's instance, you're going to want to think about what's the total volume of data and how do I manage that from a cost perspective. Uh, some other options here is Salesforce Connect. Uh, we have REST APIs, SOAP APIs, and just APIs in general. Um, you have callouts if you're going to build an Apex class and allow callouts uh, through that way. You have your Canvas, um, and you have, uh, you know, in the API bucket, you kind of have the streaming API too. So when we were considering how do we integrate Sales Cloud to um, Heroku, we were thinking of three options. Uh, uh, potentially Heroku Connect, we were thinking of the streaming API, um, and we are also thinking of um, uh, using something enterprise-wide like uh, MuleSoft. Um, and so we were thinking of those three options. And the reason we lean towards Heroku Connect is um, the bi-directional sync, um, the low maintenance on it. Um, so that was a huge pro for us is that really you just flip it on and it starts working, which is amazing. Um, and then we were also thinking of um, the cost perspective too. So that was one of the cons in the Heroku Connect um, uh, column there is it's a fairly pricey uh, tool, um, but it's well worth it if you're using it for the right type of information. Um, so let me let me actually uh, go into Heroku Connect real quick and just spend a minute or two going through that here. So if we go into our app again, we go into Heroku Connect, we're going to be able to see very quickly all of our mappings. And these are gonna be all the objects that we're syncing back and forth between our Heroku instance and our uh, sales cloud managed package. And you can see that it's pulling automatically on a regular cadence. So if we were to just jump into one of the standard objects here, contact, you can see the number of records that it's syncing. Uh, you can see the frequency at which it's syncing if we open up uh, the configuration here. Um, at an enterprise scale, you have the ability to go down um, into the single digit uh, minutes. So we could potentially pull the uh, it down into a two minute frequency if we wanted to. And then we're also able to use the streaming API to accelerate the polling of that information uh, if we need that capability as well. And then as I mentioned before, that bi-directional syncing is crucial here because we need the ability to write back and forth between these standard and custom objects. And so we actually use external keys to map the data so that there's consistency there. Okay. So jumping back over to our deck here. Okay, so now let's jump into kind of the team layout and components here. So you're thinking about building a SaaS product in Heroku. Um, you have a you know, web app or, or connect, uh, connection app or whatever you're building. Um, what do you need to think about as far as languages platform and all the other capabilities? And I've touched on some of these already and I'll speak specifically about our uh, app here, but um, you know the, these are going to be very common across uh, the different uh, types of apps you're going to be building in the Salesforce ecosystem. Uh, so the first one is languages. So from a team perspective, what do you need to be able to support from a language perspective? Uh, we actually use React as our front end, um, you know, compiler in our uh, environment, and that's going to include uh, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Um, our uh, Heroku app is built off of Node.js, so we're using combination of React and Node. Uh, to be the, the kind of the uh, um, the engine behind this. And then in the Sales Cloud Managed Package, we have Apex and uh, kind of the Lightning Framework as uh, languages we need to be able to manage as well. Um, and, and as I'm thinking about this from a team perspective, our team that actually supports this product for you know, several of our clients, or all of our clients, I should say, um, is six people. So we have three developers, and our developers are cross-functional in Heroku, uh, front-end, and back-end. Um, we have a, a QA developer, we have a product manager, and we have a product owner. And that's what makes up kind of this um, lightning fast team that we're able to roll out these um, as, uh, new features and development very quickly. So going into platforms over here, uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times, we use Heroku from the front end, we use Sales Cloud and Service Cloud as kind of the back end uh, internal interface, and we use Marketing Cloud as uh, how we uh, visualize this to our customers. And then some of the other capabilities our team needs to have in order to maintain and, and uh, manage this product 
Uh, we need to understand APIs and the integrations between all of our systems. We need to understand uh, security and how do we um, make sure that uh, the site is as durable as possible. And that's part of what we uh, go through as a um, public um, uh, app on the app exchange is going through that security review with the, the Salesforce team and making sure that is um, as bulletproof as possible. Uh, going through the data architecture, we need to understand where all of our data is sitting and how it flows back and forth. Uh, we use Google Analytics, so they need to understand Google Analytics from a, a team capability. And then, as I mentioned, we use GitHub as a repository. So how do we manage and branch and, um, and move uh, features up a pipeline inside of GitHub? Okay, so what are some of the tips? Um, going through kind of this full experience of giving you guys an example of our app and how we built it and also talking about Heroku, what are the, some of the learnings we had going throughout this process and uh, what would maybe I recommend uh, not to stumble on the, the same things we did? Um, so one of the, the first things that I will say from a product a development standpoint that I love about Heroku is Heroku pipelines. And I showed that earlier, um, being able to automatically deploy uh, review apps instantaneously with this uh, this feature has really expedited our product development. So instead of having to assemble over each other or roll out a whole new dev site for every feature, it happens in seconds, which is amazing. Um, so that's a, that's a really good tip, I would say. Go look into Heroku pipelines. Um, another thing inside of the Heroku pipelines is unit tests. Um, so we use a lot of unit tests in our de uh, development and deployment uh, to speed up the actual QA time. So those tests can do some of the standard, is the app functioning at a um, MVP level? And then we kind of do the additional um, uh, QA on top of that as we're rolling out the features. Uh, I, I think I mentioned this earlier too, we use GitHub, but we use the integration with Heroku and GitHub. So you can actually connect your uh, GitHub instance into Heroku so that there's automatic deployments um, happening for your development app and even going into production if you, you get to that stage there. Uh, so we use GitHub to make that seamless integration even faster for us. Um, we also use Jira from a, uh, a storage repository. So it's very important as you're building this product to think about how do I uh, manage uh, my team and how do I make sure that they are developing and working throughout all these, um, these components correctly. And then uh, lastly here, you want to talk about enterprise pricing. So if you're go going into Heroku from a product perspective and it's going to scale quickly, you're going to want to think about um, uh, you know, how do I price this and how does that map to my customers pricing that I'm giving to them? So some of the roadblocks that we actually encountered here um, as we're going throughout this uh, process was the initial cost. So as you're thinking about the SaaS product, you're going to need an initial um, set of investment to um, build your Heroku environment. So you can do almost all the testing here free because uh, Heroku um, is free from a, a, to a certain level, but as you're getting your first couple of clients, you're going to want to buy in um, some level of, of bulk buying to make it um, the enterprise pricing uh, worth it. So it's one thing I'll call out as, as our one of our initial roadblocks. Another initial roadblock here uh, we had was um, the information and the the knowledge around Heroku. Um, so Heroku has a lot of great documentation out there, but as we were getting into the space. Uh, we were learning some of these Heroku development items as we were going throughout it. And so we didn't have a Heroku um, you know, architect or uh, someone who knew this up front. Um, so we had to learn a lot of this going throughout this, this year long process that we've been on. And then um, knowing all the, get the gotchas about Heroku Connect is really important before getting into uh, Heroku Connect's um, uh, pricing and kind of going through that product. Um, I mentioned the object limitation earlier. There are several other limitations around Heroku Connect you need to know before you start working through that. Uh, overall, it's a fantastic tool, but there's just a couple of gotchas you need to know, um, and I would encourage you guys to research. So one of the last topics I wanted to talk through today was uh, tackling multi-tenancy. So as you're thinking about your SaaS product and going to market with it in the Heroku space, you need to think about how do I manage my app is it going to be a single tenant environment where every single time I have a new client, I need to spin up a whole app and a database and everything around it? Or are we gonna build it in a multi-tenancy infrastructure where we can really do a lot of the load balancing and, and spin up very quickly and easily? Um, in our case, we actually did a combination of both. So from a database perspective, we, uh, we did a lot of multi-tenancy around the database to allow us to scale. Um, currently in our environment, we use an app per client. 
uh, due to our scale and kind of the other Heroku Connect um, uh, constraints around it. But that's a really key point as you're thinking about this and, and thinking about past your first customer to 10 to 100 to 1,000 is how do I scale uh, through these tenants inside of Heroku and how do I make sure the pricing um, model works for us and also for our clients too. So I hope you've enjoyed this concept about um, Heroku Connect and some of the, the value that I found working in it and from a SaaS perspective here. Um, at this point, I'm going to look at the questions here and see if I can answer a couple of these. Quite a bit of questions, Shane, posted in the chat window. So okay. just pull those up right here. Okay, so first question is around um, what are the add-on price models? Um, so those are going to vary uh, based on the actual uh, add-on that you have. Each add-on has its own price and each add-on is actually built and managed uh, primarily from a, another company. Um, so there are some that are managed for Heroku, like Heroku Postgres and, and uh, Kafa and a couple other ones as well. Uh, but outside of that, it will be company by company. Uh, yes, so I will, the other question is, can I go to the beginning of my slide um, to just show my uh, social handles here? So let me go back to the beginning here. Okay. All right, so is it possible you can please touch briefly on uh, why you choose Heroku over AWS, Google, and Azure? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we did briefly look into a couple of those other um, platforms as well, and it really came down to our uh, expertise in Salesforce. And so we initially looked into um, Heroku because um, I was semi-familiar with Heroku. I was not by no means an architect at that level, um, but I was semi-familiar with it. I knew the capabilities. I knew the integration capabilities of Salesforce. I was familiar with Heroku Connect to a certain degree. And so I knew that kind of the base foundation was there that I could build on. So that was really the reason why we could, why I went there. And, uh, um, in reality, you could do the same thing we're doing on either AWS, Azure, or Google. It really just depends on how you want to scale and manage this. All right, so the next question is, will every customer need to get separate instances of Heroku for this to work, or do you manage common instance and um, uh, based on the customer Salesforce order date? Great question. Absolutely. Um, we manage a, an internal Heroku um, enterprise instance. So when we work with our clients, they don't need to know anything about Heroku. They don't manage it. They don't need to have licenses. They don't even need to have their uh, procurement team to even um, worry about the Heroku Connect piece of this other than working through our pricing model. Um, so we connect all of their instances to their own sales cloud instances in our enterprise instance. Uh, will every customer need Heroku Connect? So that's a similar one as last time. No, they did not need Heroku Connect. We have an enterprise Heroku Connect licensing and we uh, manage everything for Heroku Connect for our, our customers. Uh, there's another question about, can this be built on force.com sites? Uh, yes, it could be built on force.com sites. We decided not to do that for um, speed, scalability, and feature rollout enhancement. Uh, so we're actually able to roll out a lot of our features on a um, you know week, uh, week by week or month by month uh, cadence. Uh, without a lot of high touch in their instance and we're able to do it a lot more flexibly than having to do it in, in a more uh, managed package um, uh, type of environments and it's low touch on the customer's environments so it allows us to scale kind of detached from uh, their processes and their sales club instance uh, so next question is uh, what is the process to get an app from heroku into the app exchange um, good question so uh, when we went through the normal security review and ISV process, um, we went through that with our app exchange, or sorry, our managed package and also our Roku app. And so um, when we did that, uh, you just work with your ISV um, a partner and they uh, tell you a couple of spots to put in some extra environments, uh, environment credentials for the, the uh, security reviewers to go into your Roku environment and kind of go through a, a full uh, use case. Um, so it's, it's a pretty straightforward process, but your partner managers can help you with that. Uh, uh, so what integration tool do we support? Code control. So I, I mentioned that it was GitHub. Um, if your package is used in several orgs, how do you use Heroku Connect for syncing uh, contact information? Um, so I, I believe I answered that one as well. Um, we have uh, each one of our clients is a separate app in our Heroku environment and each app has its own instance of Heroku Connect. So we have an enterprise Heroku Connect pricing, uh, but at a app level, 
um, we actually have a Heroku Connect um, uh, instance that connects specifically into their environment. And that's how we kind of isolate the data and provide them security of their data. All right. Um, I believe there's another question about. So what is our preferable integration option other than Heroku Connect? Um, good question. So uh, Heroku Connect was at the top of our list. Secondary, we're going to look into um, the streaming API uh, because we need the capability to have this in near real time. Um, we couldn't wait for a five or 10 minute kind of scheduled uh, batch poll from using REST or SOAP APIs. And so we were looking into the streaming API. So that would have been our second route we would have gone down. Uh, I believe I've answered all those questions. Uh, so is there an initial cost of just trying and testing the Heroku platform? Nope, absolutely no cost. You can go sign up for free right now. You can spin up an app. They give you uh, kind of dev environments where you can have a dev uh, Postgres database. You can have a dev Heroku Connect uh, instance, which is really cool. And then you can uh, have a uh, dev, as many dev apps, or I think up to five dev apps um, inside of a single login as, as you'd like. So you could get going free. And that's actually what we did with our app too. We started free. Um, and then we moved over to, into the enterprise pricing. All right. Um, so there's a question about uh, why do we not use community as a front end instead of Heroku? Um, I, I think I also touched on that, just the scale building, kind of the detachment from a customer. We wanted to be able to roll out features quickly and, and uh, fast without having to work with individual clients to work through their development and production process in their instance. Uh, can, next question is, can you use Heroku for archiving? Um, good question. You could absolutely do that. Um, it's going to really depend on a lot of other criteria around uh, how much data and, and where you want to sync the information and where you want to store it, um, but feasibly it's, it's possible. And I think the last question here was around um, uh, why not use MuleSoft for, uh, for data bidirectional? Um, it's a very similar product, um, at least from a capability perspective. We chose Heroku Connect because it's low touch. Um, so we literally spin up Heroku Connect and we can get it connected in a matter of three minutes. Um, and I'm sure MuleSoft has something um, you know, similar from a scalability standpoint, um, but from a maintenance and like knowledge, um, uh, we did not need as much uh, knowledge uh, in Heroku Connect upfront as we would have using MuleSoft. We would have needed a, you know, a very expert um, opinion on that side. Um, so that was one of the reasons why we went through Heroku Connect. All right, um, these are all great questions. We have a couple minutes left here, so I just wanted to see if, um, if there are any other questions. Uh, feel free to put them in the, the Q&A box here and I can definitely go over them. Hey Shane, uh, one quick question that I definitely have is, uh, as somebody with experience on Heroku, um, what are, uh, can you outline certain key factors or considerations uh, which can really help our audience here to make a decision whether or not to go with Heroku or whether to go with a different model? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, it was brought up earlier that um, you could um, you could use uh, Google or AWS or Azure uh, for this similarly to, um, uh, to Heroku. Um, I think what you need to think about is what ecosystem are you playing in? At what scale are you trying to use it? And also, um, you know, what are you integrating into? If you're integrating into Salesforce, it's probably going to be a lot easier using Heroku than it will be a lot of those other platforms. Um, so I would think about uh, those. Um, I would also think about the infrastructure less capability you really need when you're thinking about um, Heroku versus some of the other platforms out there. Um, I can spin up an app in a matter of 30 seconds uh, where it's probably going to take me a little bit more time in some of the other uh, enterprise um, tools like this. So this is exactly what Heroku is meant for and the reason why we went down this path in the first place. Awesome. Thanks for that. I think we have a couple of more minutes and then we can just wait if there are more questions. Okay. All right, I just dropped the um, hunt code into the um, chat window for the individuals who are looking for that. Um, so you guys will be able to see that here in a moment. 
Right. Any other questions on uh, Heroku or our enterprise um, uh, SaaS product? All right. I see one more coming in here. Uh, do you need separate dynos uh, Postgres for sandbox and production instances? Yes. Yeah, so you need, um, if you're working across multiple different apps, you need a dyno per app. The dyno is, um, is kind of the Linux container that allows um, the app to, to function and to run. Um, so you would need one per app if you have uh, multiple apps. And then I see one more about the same thing on the Postgres side. So same thing, do you need uh, multiple Postgres instances for multiple apps? You can. Uh, you also don't have to, so you could actually share a single Postgres instance across uh, multiple apps, is, and that's actually what we do uh, for a lot of our clients. We use um, different schemas inside of a, the single um, database, and we share that across multiple apps, and so that's how we, we scale a lot of our backend uh, databases. Good questions. All right, I think that's uh, all the questions we have. So I, I appreciate you guys uh, coming to my session and feel free to reach out to me. You guys have my uh, LinkedIn and Twitter information here. So I uh, would love to connect with any of you. Thanks everyone.